friends, welcome to our series, Faithful Regardless. This is a study of the book of 1 Samuel. And our last look was in chapter 18. And we started to see something really terrible is happening. Saul is becoming so fiercely jealous and hateful of David that he's determined to kill him. And what we see is his fear and his hate for David grows deeper and deeper as David's renown is growing more and more as a military victorious leader within Israel. So in 1 Samuel 18, 28 through 30, here's what we read. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michal loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him and he remained his enemy the rest of his days. The Philistine commanders continued to go out to battle and as often as they did, David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers and his name became very well known. So as you see, David is becoming so popular. He's married to Saul's daughter. Saul gave him to da- gave her to David, made David do an impossible feat. David did it, killing many Philistines. And now Saul is David's father-in-law. David's married to his daughter, Michal, who we'll talk about in a little bit later. But in chapter 19, as we come into this, we see that Saul is deeply confi- conflicted and he's starting to act very irrationally. You start to see some very extreme things come out of Saul's mouth and extreme behavior from Saul on both sides. So for, for instance, the, the chapter begins with him commanding his son and his men to go and kill David. Well, then just a few verses later, he takes an oath not to kill David and that David will not be killed. But then just a few verses later, he tries to kill David himself. It was one of those episodes where David is playing the harp to try to calm Saul down when he was troubled by the evil spirit. And this time, instead of Saul being comforted, like we saw in chapter 16, he hurls a spear at David. David escaped, uh, but then Saul hunts him down and then finds him in Ramah with Samuel prophesying. Saul is prophesying. At the end of the chapter, he's naked, laying down, prophesying at Ramah. I'll get to that. It's a crazy chapter. So let's just get into it. 24 verses. 1 Samuel 19, 1 through 24. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on guard tomorrow morning. Go into a hiding place and stay there. And I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are, and I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Now, Saul, uh, Jonathan and David, Saul's son Jonathan and David are not just brothers-in-law. They're very close friends. In fact, they're not just friends. They're in a covenant relationship. That's a, a, a form of relationship where you're deeply bound to someone else deeper than brothers, actually. It means that they would fight for, even die for one another. And anyone who had an enemy of one is the enemy of the other as well. Verse 4 said, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took his oath. This oath, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. Those were Saul's words, an oath that he made. But we see that Saul is becoming psychologically and emotionally more and more unstable. You know, he's the subject of a tug of war, once from an evil spirit, then from the Holy Spirit. And these extremes, like that one, and like what we'll see later. In fact, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he would prophesy. But when the evil spirit came upon him, he would want to go out and murder. And right after he made his oath that David will never, you know, be killed, well, he goes right back on his oath. And verse 7 says, So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before, meaning things are back to normal. Once more, however, war broke out and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such a force that they fled before him. Now, David, as you see, these victories in battle were pleasing everybody except for Saul. Everyone, Israel, that's, remember, that's the kind of king that they wanted. When they said, we want a king like the other nations, one that would go out and fight for us. David was doing this way, way more than Saul was. David was the military leader they yearned for. Saul clearly was not. 
Verse nine, verse nine happens, and here we go again. An evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him, and drove Saul drove the spear into the wall. And that night, David made good his escape. Now, like I said earlier, this is very much like chapter sixteen. When Saul would get the evil spirit of the Lord was troubling him, and David would play the harp. But this time, instead of comforting, Saul tried to drive him into the wall with his spear. But David escaped and went home to his wife. Verse 11 says, Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, If you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal Michal let, let David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. And then Michal took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at its head. When Saul sent men to capture David, Michal said, He is ill. Then Saul sent the men back to David and told them, Bring him to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was the idol in the bed, and the head was with some goat hair. And Saul said to Michal, Why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? And Michal told him, He said to me, Let me get away. Why should I kill you? So you see, David's wife, his first wife, Michal, this is Jonathan's sister, didn't tell her father that she had actually helped him escape, helped him by lowering him through the window, helped him by putting, you know, sort of like a mannequin in the bed to deceive the men. And she saved David's life. David would have been killed. In fact, Saul wanted the men to bring the bed to him and kill him in his bed. Saul was a maniac. Right? But Michal, Michal is sort of a tragic figure in 1 Samuel. This is David's wife. And we see her show up here and there. We see verses about her, but we don't really know her. And I say tragic figure because she's very misunderstood, often overlooked, sometimes even scorned when we get to 2 Samuel 6, when she's kind of mocking David's procession of worship. And before we move on with this chapter, I want to take a moment and just focus on Michal. Let's give her her day in the sun, the attention that I believe she deserves. And we're going to do it through Sean Blythe. Sean Blythe is our Blythe blogger for NorthShoreNJ.org. He's a wonderful man and friend of the, part of our fellowship and friend of ours. Uh, he writes incredible blogs on different m- people that are margins of the miraculous, people that are marginal to the stories in the Word. And this one is about Michal. Take a look. We all know people who seem to get the short end of the stick at virtually every occasion. And even th- when things are going well for them, it's difficult to enjoy the moment as there is the clear expectation that it will be short-lived and when it ends, it will likely be in spectacular fashion. Michal is just such a person. She was King Saul's youngest daughter and would have been well aware of her father's fear and jealousy of David. After David turned down Saul's offer of her older sister Merab as his wife, Michal fell in love with David herself. This provided her father with an opportunity to eliminate David by requiring the death of a hundred Philistines as the price to become his son-in-law. Did Michal recognize that she was being used as a pawn in a game of royal subterfuge? Perhaps she was furious with her father for setting such a seemingly insurmountable obstacle, remembering that there was no such requirement when her father offered Merab to David. But it is equally plausible that Michal was so in love that she assumed David would conquer hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands just to be her husband. And in the end, Michal got what she wanted, and the scripture now refers to Michal as David's wife rather than Saul's daughter. But it was not long before Saul returned to his efforts to kill David. Michal maintained her allegiance to David rather than her, than her father. When Saul's men came looking for David, she took an idol, placed it in bed with goat hair around it in order to make it look like David was sleeping and therefore giving him time to escape. The presence of an idol in the house would suggest that although Michal was in love with David, her undivided love did not extend to the God of Abraham. It is possible that she worshiped the man that God had created rather than God the creator. This is a mistake which inevitably leads to disappointment, and would so in this case. At this point, Michal's life takes a turn for the worse as David is on the run. David takes time to try to find refuge for his parents while on the run from Saul, but there is no such kindness toward his wife. 
Instead, over the same time period, David takes other wives, and Saul reclaims his abandoned daughter and gives her to a man named Paltiel. Let's be clear. Michal is not being treated fairly. Her father used her for political advantage, and her husband has abandoned and forsaken her. Michal's life is not turning out as she may have imagined so many years earlier when she fell in love with a brave, handsome young man. It is only when David is about to be anointed king of Israel that he demands that Michal be taken from Paltiel and returned to him. There is no record of a joyous reunion and no indication that this was a rekindling of long-lost love. I believe that somewhere between helping David escape from her father and a return to David, the love that she had for her husband died. In its place was a bitterness that would become apparent in the next mention we have of Michal, who is now once again referred to in scripture as the daughter of Saul, rather than the wife of David. In celebration, David danced as the Ark of the Covenant was returned to Jerusalem. However, Michal was furious, and the anger in her sarcastic attack is palpable. How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. And David responds with an equally devastating reply, stating that he simply doesn't care what she thinks, and actually places more importance in the honor bestowed on him by slave girls than any concerns of Michal. It is a painful end to the relationship, and Michal is only mentioned one last time as being childless till death. Michal saw a man of God behave in the worst possible ways. She married him when he was nothing but a young soldier, but now that he was king, she was no longer worthy of his attention or honor. There must be an enduring loneliness in that position. It is not possible to know the full story here, and perhaps I'm having more empathy for Mahal than she really deserves. Perhaps she was rejected by God just like her father was. But it is equally plausible that just like so many other women who were treated like property, bartered and traded for the benefit of others. It is a reminder of the role that we as Christians must play when we see the Michals of the world being treated unfairly. Now, I often wonder what would have happened if Michal had a godly influence in her life besides the clearly flawed David. Somebody to reinforce that the unfairness of this physical world is temporary and must not distract us from our spiritual responsibilities. Somebody to remind her that her role on this earth is not limited to being Saul's daughter or David's wife. Somebody to remind her that our eyes must remain on our creator, not the created. We should actively search for the opportunities to be that somebody. So back to this chapter, verse chapter 19, we see how Michal provided a way for David to escape Saul. David would have died there on the spot if it weren't for Michal. We pick it up in chapter 19, verse 18. When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Naoth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came on Saul's men and they also prophesied. And Saul was told about it, so he sent more men, and they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time, and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great cistern at Saku. And he asked, where are David and Samuel? Over in Naoth at Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah, but the Spirit of the Lord came even on him. And he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his garments, and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence. He laid naked all that day and all that night. And this is why the people say, is Saul also among the prophets? It's crazy what Saul's going through. He's, he's hunting down David to try to kill him. He would have killed him in his, his bed had his daughter not allowed him to escape. He's trying to kill him. And then he comes to Naoth at Ramah, where Samuel lives. And Samuel is part of this very powerful group of men prophesying, worshiping. And he sent three teams of men to try to get David and capture David. And each one of those teams was struck down with the spirit of the Lord prophesying. So Saul went himself, and it happened to him. And now, he, by the end of the chapter, he's lying naked in Naoth, the Ramah, prophesying crazy crazy now 
<laughs> we have to know this, is that Saul was filled with vengeance and jealousy and murderous hate for David. But that was no match for the power of the Spirit of God that was evident and present in Naoth Ramah. So Saul came up against something he could not overcome, he could not contend with. Now I want to say this, prophesying in this context is not like you see it in some other context where it's a, a, a prophet speaking a word from God to a certain people, to a, you know, a direct message from God, nor is it predicting the future here. Um, prophesying was most closely associated with like an all-consuming worship and praise, often had music, like a big worship service. Uh, similar to what Saul experienced in Gibeah when he first was, uh, was called to be king. When he was first selected, remember 1 Samuel 10, 9, it says, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, this is Samuel sending him out, he says, you're the one, God changed Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled in that day. And when he and his servant arrived at, Gib arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him and the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, upon him and he joined in their prophesying. So it wasn't just speaking words of God, but it was speaking words to God. It was what we would know as a big, all-consuming, powerful worship service. And that's what happened to Saul at the end of the chapter. That's how this chapter ends with Saul experiencing this and he's laying prostrate on the floor day and night naked prophesying. I don't get it, but it was powerful. Obviously, it humbled him. It brought him not just to his knees, but flat on his face. So you would think that this was a pinnacle moment, a turning point for Saul. Because <laughs> what happens? What happens to Saul? Well, you would hope that Saul's heart was changed. You would hope that the same thing that took place in Gibeah took place here. You would hope that he repents of this murderous hatred he has for David and that he recaptured the Spirit of God and it all ends well. But sadly, no, that's not the case. The sin in his heart was so deep and his hatred and jealousy with David was so pervasive and so strong that nothing changed as a result of this powerful moment in Ramah. Saul's heart did not change. He held on to that deep hatred, that, that, that bitterness, that murderous heart that he had towards David. It was so deep. In fact, in the very next chapter, we'll see it next time, Saul hurls a spear at his own son, Jonathan, simply for Jonathan asking a question. That's how it happens. Saul's, the rest of his days are marked with evil and hatred and, and, and utter failure. So question, why didn't the experience in Ramah change him? I mean, he came face to face, overcome with the Spirit of God. He was prophesying, worshiping, he had an incredible moment. Why didn't it change him? And the answer is because he harbored sin in his heart and he would not let go of that sin. Now, I thought it would have been a tremendous experience uh, if you see Saul after this moment where everything, he repents of his sin, and he turns to God because it seems that the Holy Spirit had gotten a hold of him. But that experience in the Athet Ramah was an event, not a continuum. It was an event, not a continuum. And we have to understand this for our lives as well. You know, oftentimes we are seeking an event, a one-time event that will change our life and set us in the right direction. Now, sometimes it happens. We have all seen that happen. But when we're seeking for an event to change our lives or fulfill our longing for God's power, we often are just searching for something and not someone. You're searching for an experience and not the Creator. And I want to say, I, you know, I, I hope to see revival. I hope to see an outpouring. I hope to see visitation. I hope that, you know, something like Pentecost can happen in our church or in our nation. I really do. But God is not as concerned with an event in our life as he is with an ongoing continuum. Because a one-time event in our life may or may not change things, but an ongoing continuum will have long-term growth, long-term fruit, and accomplish his purposes over time. 
You see, our hearts can change at any time, any place, any circumstances. We don't need visitation, outpouring, revival for our hearts to change. We don't need to see tongues of fire and rushing wind to make a genuine commitment to the Lord and repent of our sins and turn ourselves around. Because if you're just waiting for that, you may wait forever. God wants us now. David was always willing to spin on a dime and repent when his sin was revealed. Saul was not. You know, revival is amazing. When it happens, it's awesome. It's awesome to see God move powerfully. People come to the Lord. You know, it's, it's amazing when you see God do things that are far above what anyone would have expected or even imagined. Revival. Renewal, however, can begin at any time. Simply by asking God to take his place as king of your heart and giving him lordship over all things. Then renewal will start. It could start right now. You don't have to wait for revival. It could start right now. But this is something Saul did not do when he left Ramah. He didn't change his life. He did not change his heart. But it is something we should do and we can do. We can experience restoration, revival, renewal. We can re- re- experience the renewal that comes from a renewed heart at any time. Saul didn't, but David did. I mentioned before that when David was confronted with his sin, he didn't hide it, he didn't stuff it, he didn't galvanize it, he repented of it. And he repented before the Lord. You know, we have that very well-known prayer in Psalm 51, and it's a prayer of repentance to, to, to God from David. But it didn't come from the, a powerful experience like Gibeah or Ramah. It didn't come from like a Pentecost experience that something happened and the environment was so explosive that David decided to repent. It came from one of the lowest valleys in David's life, filled with sadness and remorse and emptiness and regret and shame. And out of the depths, He cried out out of the depths. And in in Psalm 51, it says this, 10 through 12, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. God, David prayed that to God and God granted it. Saul did not pray that to God. And Saul became more and more bitter. And I want to say this, regardless of what you're experiencing in your Christian life today, whether it's tremendous victory and you're having powerful times of worship, that's great, or maybe you're someone that's just feeling defeated and disconnected from God in worship and prayer in life. Either way, he wants to create a clean heart in you and renew you with a willing spirit or a right spirit or a steadfast spirit, as the versions will say different versions. And the reason is not to give you a one-time event, but an ongoing continuum so that you can walk more closely with him in your life, so that you can experience the goodness of God here in the land of the living, and so that you can lead others, everyone else, into the joy and love that the, the Heavenly Father wants so desperately for them. Continuing this walk this journey with with fruit and with joy and with purpose. This is what God wants for you. Now, yes, we pray for revival. Boom, I hope it happens. We pray for it in our church, our nation, in the whole world. Absolutely, I hope it happens. But until it does, let's just pray for renewal and restoration. Ask God to renew and to restore you. Renew and restore. Ask him to renew a steadfast spirit within you and restore to you the joy of salvation. And my hope and prayer for you is that you would be renewed and restored and even revived as you give more and more of your heart to God every single day of this brand new season. May God bless you.